So uh, welcome every again, once again, uh, uh, today we are talking about macro photography, but uh, we're, we're going to be doing it in, in terms of uh, how to photograph airplanes. And uh, thanks again to our hosts at Action Camera. They, uh, they have, uh, for those of you, I know I have some friends tuning in across the country. They have locations in Roseville, California, which is uh, kind of in the uh, Sacramento area. And then they also have a location in Reno. So uh, good opportunities to go visit them when you're out on the road. Good folks. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll get started here again. As I mentioned, I'm Tamron Tech Jeff. If you run into a question that we don't get answered during the, the question and answer presentation or, you know, something you wake up in a cold sweat at two in the morning and say, oh, I meant to ask Jeff this. Uh, again, drop me a note at one of the social media. Generally, the messages on Facebook and Instagram get to me pretty quickly. Twitter, sometimes they float in. Uh, and then I'll do my best to uh, spot them and, uh, and get an answer out to you as well. So uh, thanks again for joining us. And I want to talk just a wee bit about the, uh, the title shot I have up here, the title slide. This was a photograph just about a year ago, about a year ago this week, actually, uh, at a little, uh, not really a true air show, but an air demonstration and, uh, and a fundraiser. Uh, I live in Northern Colorado and uh, these uh, these planes uh, were parked at the uh, and flying in and out of the uh, uh, the uh, Fort Collins Loveland Airport, uh, which I think is now called the, uh, the Front Range or something like that. Rocky Mountain, no, Rocky Mountain is the one that used to be known as Jeffco. Anyway, uh, nearby where I live, and uh, this isn't a composite shot. This is a straight out of the camera uh, image that uh, I saw. As the, as the planes were finishing up flying for the day and, and uh, taxiing in and, and, uh, and you know, they, they fly uh, passengers around to, to, to raise money to keep the planes flying. And the P-51 in the foreground there was just pulling in and just pulled in and, and there was a thunderstorm kind of uh, rumbling off of the foothills to our, uh, to our west. And most of the lightning was actually happening out of the frame to camera right. And I was thinking, well, I'll just, the sunset's spectacular. I'm at least going to get some beautiful shots of the planes. Uh, the lights were just coming on on the, uh, on the airfield to illuminate the planes. And uh, I use a device called a lightning bug from a company called MK Controls. And it's, it slides onto your camera where the, where the speed light would go. And then it has a cable that plugs into the uh, cable release slot and it has a sensor and when it sees that little infrared that happens just before the visible flash of lightning it triggers the shutter and if it's within the uh, the camera's frame uh, you get you get a shot like this and I had a whole bunch of shots where there was like a tiny little bit right in the edge of the corner and nothing was happening anywhere near the edge of the frame and I was just about uh, done uh, as as the light was the light was changing and the sun was going down, uh, but I I got lucky and Mom Nature decided to give me one quick blast right there in the middle of the frame. Uh, what I did for exposure was I I just exposed basically for the sky and the sunset and the foreground, um, and this was a manual exposure because I wanted to let the camera uh, just keep firing away and not having to. Uh, uh, not having to let it change up. And of course, I also switched to manual focus because again, the camera would, uh, would uh, if I didn't put it in uh, manual focus with, uh, with that relatively low contrast of the center of the scene, uh, it might tend to hunt for focus. So uh, my exposure ended up being ISO 400 at 1 80th of a second at F11. And I was at about 30, mil 30 millimeters on the Tamron 18 to 400 millimeter lens which is designed uh, specifically for crop sensor cameras. And I'll explain a little bit more about that as we go through the presentation. But I get a lot of questions about that shot. So I always like to explain how it was made. Uh, and the first thing we're gonna talk about is controlling your camera. Uh, most of us, you know, ag again, when we do these presentations, we're gonna have everybody from seasoned veterans to, to fairly new people to 
uh, to changeable and adjustable lens cameras. So I'm going to just start with the basics. Uh, when you start out, you know, you can put that camera in the auto mode, the green box, auto everything, and it can be your best friend. I have, I have friends who shoot weddings in, in uh, the, the fully auto or the program mode, uh, although they, you know, they're, they know what they're doing and they know when to override. Uh, and it, if you don't know what you're doing and you don't know when to override, what can happen is that green box setting can give you perfectly exposed blurs or worse. So uh, again, maybe move to the program mode that will give you a little bit of control or go to those scene modes. And, and this may be an analog dial on your camera like you see here, or it may be, um, it may be something in an LCD panel. And I will tell you uh, throughout the presentation for settings on your specific camera, uh, refer to your owner's manual or if you don't like the owner's manual because it can be dry and boring and hard to find things. Your camera body manufacturer also probably has some great tutorials on their YouTube or other social media channels that'll allow you to learn about specific settings on your camera. And usually they'll have uh, a tutorial on, on most of their current or popular or recent models. And uh, from body maker to body maker, um, obviously these things can be dramatically different, but within a product line, from a particular maker, they will vary a little bit. Uh, so if they don't have one for your particular camera, they'll probably have something for a similar camera that'll help out. But if you go to the scene mode, uh, again, if you're, if you're new and you just wanna make sure that you're getting more good than bad shots, um, there'll be like, there'll be a head and shoulders, which is great for portraits. There will be a little mountain, which is great for landscape. There'll be a flower icon for close-up photography. And then there's usually something like a running man uh, that's gonna be uh, very helpful for shooting uh, your action shots and your, uh, you know, sports and air shows and things like that. And the, uh, uh, the portrait setting might be better for, for instance, uh, photographing the static displays on the ramp. And then once you get more comfortable with your camera, I come from, I come from way back in the last century shooting film. And my first camera was totally manual, totally mechanical. I had to focus. I had to set the correct shutter speed, aperture, and set the ISO based on the speed of the film that I put in the camera. It was called ASA back then. And uh, those settings uh, had to all intermatch to make sure that I got a correct exposure. And as I was learning, I used to take those little spiral notebooks with me and write copious notes about each frame I was exposing uh, so that when I processed the film uh, or, or got it back from the lab, depending upon whether I was sending it out or doing it myself, then I could refer back to my notes and, and look at the negatives or the slides or the prints and I could see what was successful and what wasn't. So that was, that was part of my learning curve. Uh, and eventually, you know, that led to photo club and, and classes in high school, and then a, an actual degree in photography in college. And that and six bucks will still today get me a big latte at the, at the coffee shop. So uh, a lot of self-teaching and a lot of going to seminars back in the day and webinars and reading and so on. And uh, I learned from that. And of course, your camera nowadays, once we graduate to shutter priority or aperture priority or manual mode, uh, the camera records all of that information. It'll tell you what focal length you were shooting, what ISO, uh, the shutter speed and aperture. So you have all that data right at your fingertips. And it's, uh, again, use that as a basis to learn from your successes and, and especially from your mistakes. And, uh, and that's, that's how we grow. So I'll talk next about understanding shutter speed because especially with the action portion shooting planes in the air, uh, knowing what shutter speeds to choose are gonna be critical. Uh, shutter speeds are broken down in fractions of a second and the numbers that you see here represent stops uh, equivalent to one aperture stop or one F stop on your lens. And again, we'll come back around to that in a minute. 
so uh, again, it's having a doubling basically. A 60th of a second lets in twice as much light as one 125th, which lets in half as much or twice as much light, I should say, as one 250th. And so as we increase speed, we're cutting the, uh, the, cutting the speed or the amount of light in half. So we have to open up the aperture or increase our ISO to compensate for that. And it, obviously we need high shutter speeds if we want to stop motion. Here's a little guide that I've, uh, that I've put together, my colleagues and I have put together. And these are some good starting points. Now it is somewhat focal length dependent, longer focal length lenses in, in, induce, introduce uh, camera shake too, or, or, or shake just because everything is magnified, including any movement. So a motionless subject with a, with a, a short normal lens uh, it, or a wide angle lens, you can easily shoot at a 60th of a second or below. And if nothing's moving, you're going to get a sharp photograph. But as things start to move, you're going to need to go higher and higher. Um, a slowly moving subject, the plane taxing on the ramp, 125th or 250th of a second is good. I'll come back to 250th of a second for a very specific reason in a minute. And then propeller planes, I like to shoot, if at all possible, at a 250th. Uh, and again, I'm coming back to this because, as you'll see in our next slide, um, you get a little bit of motion blur in the prop and photo editors and, uh, you know, occasionally sell photos. Photo editors like to see that motion blur in propellers because it shows that you're not just, uh, again, compositing a, a static plane into, uh, into another scene or something like that. Uh, and then as the planes get into the air, uh, again, uh, fast moving planes, the faster they're moving, the higher your shutter speed is going to need to be. And I'll show you plentiful examples so you'll understand what you're going to need to do when you get out to, uh, to photographing air shows. Uh, you also, if you have an opportunity, some folks like to take a moment to do a little screen grab of this uh, or even, you know, pick up the camera and just uh, snap a photo off of the screen so that you can uh, keep these for later reference if you want. So the reason I love 250, uh, 250th of a second for uh, propellers is this shot. Um, I was literally not strapped in, leaning out the waist gunner's port of a B-25 plane uh, one afternoon after the Reno air races were done. And, and uh, this was one of the, the, the race planes and it was posing, so to speak, for photos. Now the publisher of the magazine that bought this photo from me and ended up putting it on the cover was at the back of the plane. He had a nice clear view of, of uh, the plane is called the rare bear and the rare bear was coming up just behind us uh, at, a, at a safe distance. And, and he was laying on some nice pads and cushioned and strapped in so he couldn't fall out the back of the plane. And I was kind of along for the ride and just hanging uh, virtually uh, this was before wrist straps were common. I had wrapped my neck strap around my wrist and I was hanging the, the, the camera out, the, out this port of the plane uh, to try and get the shot. And uh, this was originally a horizontal shot uh, that was cropped vertically. But that 250 of a second gives that motion blur on the prop and that's what, uh, uh, oh, that's what uh, photo editors like to see. Again, here's some other examples. Even with the uh, in-body stabilization or many of the Tamron lenses actually have stabilization built into the lens. Uh, most of the mirrorless cameras have in-body stabilization, so we don't have uh, the need to put it in, uh, in lenses for mirrorless cameras quite so much. But even, uh, even at 125th of a second, if you're racked all the way out, even with stabilization turned on, you may get that little bit of a blur like you see with the helicopter dangling the car there. Uh, so I bumped up, I could, I could even see the blur as I was reviewing uh, shots in the field. So I bumped up to a 250th of a second. I don't get quite as nice the, of motion blur, but everything is just rock solid sharp and it's a, it's a picture you're gonna be able to enlarge or print if you need to. Now with the, the other upper right-hand corner that you see uh, with the B-17 doing a flyby, again, that 250th of a second, uh, here I was using uh, the camera handheld, although this would be a good shot uh, to uh, put the, these kinds of shots to put the camera on the tripod and in a gimbal if you have one uh, that rocks back and forth. I'll show you what that's about uh, momentarily as well. But here, handheld 250th of a second uh, with the stabilization turned on and that uh, panning with the plane as it flew across in front of me allowed me to get some, uh, some nice 
tack sharp uh, images of the uh, of the aircraft itself, but that nice blur of the propellers. Now, if we go to the lower two shots there, uh, at a at an air show uh, last fall, I was at in uh, Fort Worth. Uh, if you can, most air shows, not all air shows, but most air shows are usually two, sometimes even three days. So if you have the luxury of being able to go uh, maybe even on the practice day, uh, usually they're Saturday, Sunday, so I'll go on Friday if I have the luxury of time and go out and even if I can't get on access to the airfield, I'll stand at the end of a runway or near the airfield or on a hill overlooking the airfield or something and watch the, uh, the aerobatic teams do their, uh, uh, do their shows because they do the same show every day uh, and they wanna practice the first day so that uh, they know what things are gonna look like, what landmarks they can use for, for visual navigation and so on. Uh, but as you can see here on day one, I didn't have a chance to go uh, to the practice day. So I was shooting not only uh, teaching uh, the attendees at the air show for, uh, for our group, uh, but I was also shooting with the intention of, of including shots in the, in the presentation here. At a thousandth of a second, when these jets do these crossover flybys, um, you, you start with, you pick a, a, a plane from coming from camera left or coming from camera right, whatever you prefer. And, you know, you acquire focus and get the crop or the zoom set where you want it and just kind of follow it across in front of you and put the camera, of course, in the continuous frame advance. And then uh, as the planes cross, you're gonna get that shot um, if everything goes well on your part. Uh, but at a thousandth of a second, uh, the closure rate of these two planes is, you know, somewhere around a thousand miles an hour or more. And uh, two planes moving that fast. I was panning with one, so it was sharp. The one coming through from camera left uh, was moving too fast and I got a blur. So the next day I adjusted shutter speed and uh, bumped up to a thousand or four thousandth of a second and that was fast enough to be able to uh, have everything nice and sharp as both aircraft were panning or were shooting uh, shooting across the sky in front of me and again i i picked up a can uh, a one of the planes coming from camera right lock focus and uh, i use continuous focus which we'll talk more about in a moment and uh, and again got the got the shot that i was uh, i was hoping for now it's also important to understand aperture and depth of field and how that works for you more so when you're doing the static displays, the photos of the planes on the ground. Pardon me, because that's a big part of the air show too. And uh, this, again, aperture is a little bit, especially if you're new to photography, counterintuitive. The small numbers represent the large apertures, the large volumes of light. So if you have a lens that's, uh, that's maybe, you know, f5.6 or a smaller number, 4, 2.8, uh, if you have uh, fixed lenses, you might even be able to get to, to f2, f1.4, uh, or even larger in some cases. Uh, these allow a large volume of light through, uh, but they also have very shallow, what we call depth of field. So beyond your point of focus, especially with those apertures larger than 5.6, um, you're not gonna have a lot in focus in front and behind your focus point. So that's important to remember. Uh, the, the advantage of stopping down is of course, you, you increase your depth of field, you're gonna have more in focus uh, be behind and in front of what you focused on. And again, for the static displays on the ramp, that can be important, not as much for the planes in the sky, but you also probably wanna shoot uh, kind of a mid, middle aperture uh, for planes in flight, uh, especially when they're doing aer aerobatic maneuvers, uh, because not always does autofocus uh, keep up with the, with the movement of the subject. So that gives you a little bit of, of, uh, of uh, depth of field uh, to compensate for any minor focus errors too. Now here's a, another good example of what aperture and depth of field will do for you. Again, at a large aperture, that little blue flower, obviously not a airplane, but that little blue flower is nice and sharp and in focus and the background is indistinct. And that's probably the look we're going for here because as you can see, as we begin to stop down 5.6, 11, 16 and 22, uh, even though the focus point hasn't changed, the camera's focus didn't change off of the, the pretty blue flower, but more comes in focus in the background and in the foreground, although that's, you don't see it there because there's nothing in the foreground. But 
all of a sudden, your nice sharp flower with an indistinct background has, uh, if you stop down, a cluttered background. And that's gonna take the viewer's eye away from your intended subject, what you want the viewer to lock onto and see in the photo. So it's important to experiment with apertures and see what's gonna work for what you intend the viewer to see in your final uh, photo. So then when we get out on the ramp, here's some, uh, here's some examples of using that uh, in play. Now, uh, the upper left-hand shot uh, with uh, uh, this Lockheed Elector, that's the same kind of plane that uh, Amelia Earhart uh, took on her ill-fated journey around the world. And in fact, the, the, the woman that owns this plane wants to, with modern avionics in the plane, uh, uh, raise money to try and eventually recreate uh, and uh, successfully complete the round the world flight in a 1930s vintage aircraft. But you have a lot of interesting things going on here. You've got a plane that's basically just that beautiful shiny reflective aluminum with very little paint on it, which means it drives your light meter nuts. And we'll talk about exposure compensation in a few moments. Uh, but you wanna make sure that you get the exposure correct on something like this. Now, this is one of the few shots that has any post-processing done. I did throw a little vignette around it just to kind of darken the sky and throw in a little uh, vignette shadow underneath the plane too, again, to add the emphasis to it. Uh, but the, the big thing there is uh, using a, a zoom lens on the ramp that gives you a lot of versatility. Uh, you can get that wider shot. Now the 28 to 300 is designed for full frame cameras, but it works great on crop sensor cameras. And uh, and the 18 to 400, if you have a crop sensor camera, would be probably the perfect lens because you get even more wide angle and even more telephoto if you need it. And that I'm not afraid, to, I'll take my macro lens along if I have room and put it on and shoot detail work with it. So those next two, uh, uh, the center and upper right hand photo were made with the 90 macro, very sharp lens. And again, it's gonna give you incredible detail, even on areas as, uh, as, uh, as small as you want to get. It will go to life size. So if you're photographing something an inch in diameter like a quarter uh, or that, uh, that manufacturer's uh, information plate there, uh, you're going to actually see uh, great detail when you bring the, the photo out. And then I'll, I'll use uh, short normal lenses or, or kind of intermediate zooms for good detail work too, like I did with the two bottom photos. And those were both shot with the, with the Tamron 45 millimeter lens, uh, which is, uh, you know, that's, that's what uh, you may have heard of the Nifty 50. You may own one. Uh, this would be Tamron's uh, thought about making that focal length. And it's just a, a, a perfect lens. The 45 millimeter uh, is the same focal length essentially as your eye. So it's a very comfortable perspective to work with. And it also does great for close focus. And I'll even take a portrait uh, focal length lens like the 85 millimeter and uh, experiment with that. And of course, sometimes you'll have reenactors, uh, you know, people dressed in period garb around airplanes and, and you can get those involved And the 85 is a fantastic lens to shoot people with. But it's also great for, for detail and, uh, and seeing small things on, on, in, your, uh, in your shot. Now here, uh, just to experiment, I shot wide open at f1.8 on the marker light on that tip of the wing. And as you can see, everything falls off into the out of focus area very quickly. Now, it, I also shot at a number of other apertures, but I ended at f16, which is where that lens uh, stops down to at its, uh, at its close down end. And I focused a little actually closer to the cockpit and used what we call hyperfocal distance. I focused about a third of the way into the scene and that gets uh, everything from that wingtip to the, to the cockpit uh, canopy and even the clouds in the sky. They're not perfectly in focus, but pretty close in focus. If I used the 45, everything would have been uh, in intact sharp focus there. But that's something you can use to your advantage. So if you are wanting maximum depth of field, with any focal length, if you focus about a third of the way into the scene, you're going to get the closest uh, in the foreground that the lens is capable of giving, and you're going to get uh, as far in the different uh, the distance as capable 
uh, as the lens is capable of giving. Now there are all kinds of apps that you can download like photo pills and all sorts of depth of field guides that will give you uh, this information on your phone because we used to have it engraved on lenses and uh, that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, but you can, uh, you can plug information into an app and tell it I'm using an 85 millimeter or whatever focal length. My subject is gonna be X number of feet or meters away and uh, it will tell you what's gonna be in focus from near to far at whatever aperture you're choosing. So great tools to think about downloading to your phone too. The next thing we need to talk about is the ISO, the, the camera's sensitivity to light. ISO stands for International Standards Organization and uh, they make sure that from camera to camera to camera, they see light the same way so that we're not confused about how exposure is gonna work. And the, the rule of thumb here is use the lowest ISO you can. If your camera goes down to 50 or 64 or 100 uh, on, on stationary subjects, on bright days, if you're sitting on a tripod, uh, those lower apertures are gonna give you the best sharpness, the best color, uh, the best contrast. And then it, it, as, as circumstances dictate, you may have to go to higher and higher ISOs. And you do at some point start to lose image quality and uh, pick up what we call noise, which uh, used to be, if, again, if you go back to film, we used to refer, that, refer to that as grain and a different uh, thing happens, but it looks the same kind of in a finished photo. Uh, so uh, choosing the right ISO is very important. And again, this is one of those ones where you might want to do a quick screenshot or take a snapshot uh, with your phone of this. I'll leave it up for a few moments. Uh, but here again, even on a bright sunny day down in uh, 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 east, of, uh, east of San Diego at an airfield, we were shooting an air show. And even on a bright sunny day, <clears throat> pardon me, to get what I wanted in terms of high enough shutter speed, and small enough aperture, I, I had to go to ISO 800 so that I could get my 250th of a second. I think I was stopped down to, to uh, uh, F22 or F32 with this, and I was racked all the way out at that uh, 600 millimeters on the 150 to 600. Uh, now, as newer cameras uh, have come out, uh, their ability to shoot better at higher and higher ISOs has gotten significantly better too. There are a couple of uh, S series models from Sony uh, that can shoot with a native ISO. Most cameras have a native ISO of around uh, 100 to 200. Uh, the Sony's uh, S series cameras, 7S series cameras, are ISO 51,200. So they're, they're purpose built for shooting in very low light. So they're not a camera that you wanna run right out and get for your everyday shooting. But if you find that you're doing, a, and you're a Sony shooter, if you find that you're doing a lot of low light shooting, those can be great choices as tools for your, uh, your arsenal. Now, just for fun, uh, I, I do a birding presentation too. I went out a few weeks ago, one afternoon about dusk uh, or, or just after sunset and, uh, and I took my 150 to 600, I forgot to label this slide, uh, and shot at ridiculously high ISOs. And, and here's, uh, here's kind of your first homework assignment. Take your camera out, maybe late afternoon or even dusk, set it up on a tripod and shoot the same scene at different ISOs. Start at the low ISOs, 50 or 100, uh, 200, 400, 800, you know, just kind of keep going up in, in doubling uh, increments, 1600, 3200, 6400, higher if you want to. And then uh, come back and look at the images on your computer screen or better yet, uh, you know, go into Action Camera or, or your local camera store or at least go to your, your own printer and make some prints. Eight by tens work great for this. And, and take a look at the difference that you see uh, in noise and color rendition as you go up to those higher and higher ISOs. Now some cameras, if you have maybe an older camera, uh, you might not be able to go much beyond 800 or maybe 1600. Newer cameras, I shot this with my Nikon D500, which does exceptionally well in low light. Uh, the left-hand shot there of that great blue heron is at 12,800. And uh, just for fun, I went up uh, a, few, a half hour later or so, it was almost dark. I shot at ISO 40,000 
And uh, I shot this handheld on the 150 to 600 in the mode three stabilization, which is maximum stabilization. And I was able to shoot at 1 40th of a second handheld at F8. And I got uh, that ISO 40,000 shot. So uh, it's, it's noisy. Um, I probably wouldn't make a print much bigger than an eight by 10 with it. Uh, and, and you can also bring uh, those images, those high ISO images back. And there are all sorts of programs uh, that, that you may own or that you can purchase that do noise reduction too. So that's a possibility and they can give you back some of the noise and sharpness uh, uh, that you lose at these high ISOs. But it's fun to experiment and it's good to know what your camera is capable of doing, especially when you get into low light shooting situations. So you know what to expect and you know when it's just time to enjoy the moment and maybe put the camera away or just keep shooting to push the limits. Exposure compensation is gonna be something that I mentioned earlier, and it's something to really be aware of when you're doing air shows and a lot of other shooting situations. Again, the scene that you see here, perfectly exposed, but it's not what the light meter thought was correct. This is actually uh, a shot that was made that's two stops uh, wider open or two shutter speeds lower than what the light meter thought was correct because light meters uh, generally look, uh, even if you're looking at an evaluative light meter reading, they look kind of at the center of the scene and give it the greatest weight. And what will happen is uh, in this situation, it sees that dark subject kind of a little off center, but it also sees that huge bright white area from the, from the snow and the ice. And <clears throat> simply you'll end up, if you don't compensate, with a beautiful silhouette of your friend and the dog. So you don't want that to happen. You want to learn, again, go to your owner's manual or one of the tutorials from your body maker and find out where exposure compensation is for your camera. It might be a plus minus icon like that. It might be an analog dial or it might be something on an LCD panel on the top or the back screen. So again, find out where it is. And then again, here's your next homework assignment. Do a little experiment and see what and when and where uh, exposure compensation is gonna be useful for you. Uh, this slide was put together by one of my colleagues. I don't have what the meter thought was correct, but you can pretty well extrapolate from here. At one stop under, you get that nice uh, kind of silhouette of the skyline, which is, uh, which is probably the intended exposure. At two stops under, it starts to get a little bit dark, uh, but then just experiment and going one stop over, you start to see that clutter in the foreground. And two stops over, you realize that you're shooting from the top of a commercial building with exhaust fence and uh, somebody there that needs to, uh, to mow their weeds or, or get a ticket pretty soon. So again, just by playing with the exposure, you're going to see that uh, uh, it can make a huge difference in your shot. And when you have a backlit shot or bright airplanes uh, against, a, you know, maybe dark airplanes against a bright sky or dark airplanes or bright airplanes against a dark sky on a cloudy day, you're gonna to need to compensate. Stability when you're out in the field is also important. Talk to, your, talk to the folks at the store. Uh, you may already own a tripod or two. They may or may not be right for, uh, for your needs. So again, uh, be sure uh, to look into uh, to tripods. I, you know, I, I've been doing this a long time. I probably have within 10 feet of me, four or five different tripods, two or three more out in the car. Uh, because again, I'll, I'll use different tripods for different shooting situations. Uh, but talk to the folks at the store and they can make recommendations for, you know, maybe you have to narrow it down uh, for budget purposes to just a tripod. They'll help you find the one that's gonna fit your needs and your budget best. Uh, the, the more you invest, the more stable the tripod is going to be, and if you go with some of the, uh, the some of the new space age fibers like carbon fiber, you're going to get tripods that are incredibly stable and incredibly lightweight. Now you pay for that lightweight and stability, but sometimes again, uh, those are the kind of things that you invest in once, and you don't have to go back and buy several different tripods. Maybe a monopod is also an incredibly useful little tool. Just a stick, a single leg. 
Uh, and again, these are going to be at different stability levels, different price points, but even a relatively lightweight monopod will give you some stability. And the biggest benefit that uh, a monopod will give you at an air show is taking all the stress off of your back and neck and shoulders. When you're, when you're out uh, shooting all day long and you're scrunched up like that, and maybe you're using a long telephoto lens, if you're shooting handheld all day, you're going to walk away from the air show hunched over at the end of the day. Uh, you're going to be unhappy. Uh, you're going to be looking for that, you know, ibuprofen or whatever in the car and, and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So a monopod or a tripod can take all that stress off of your back and neck. Now, the other little device that you see here in the upper right-hand corner is a gimbal head. And I will generally, if I'm shooting um, at an air show where I'm at air show center or I'm teaching and I'm using a long lens, I'll put, uh, and, and this goes for bird photography too, I'll put the camera on a gimbal head. And what it does is very smoothly lets you rock back and forth, tilt up and down and pan left and right. And again, it's on the tripod. I've had less success with one on a monopod, but I do occasionally go that route as well. But on a tripod, certainly, uh, it just, it's, it's one of those things that is going to make for, uh, once you get comfortable with using it, probably more good photos that you can get handheld. And uh, again, a lot of situations beyond air shows, birding, um, and, you know, any kind of moving subjects, uh, a gimbal head can be very helpful for you. So again, the folks at the store can explain more about that and what's going to work best for your needs and budget, because again, these come at different, uh, different price levels. Uh, getting out uh, actually into the field and talking about composition, um, I, you know, I used to talk and I, and I taught for a long time the rule of thirds and, uh, and those sorts of things. It's more of a suggestion. Um, try and get subjects in your scene that are close to those intersection points like you see here. Uh, some cameras will even have a display that you can turn on on your viewfinder or on the back view screen that will give you that grid pattern so you can think about that when you're composing photos. And uh, photos are a little bit stronger if you can get a strong subject about a third of the way in from a side or from the top or the bottom, and that becomes the anchor for your photos. Now, again, with moving subjects like planes, it's hard to do. Uh, but use that if you can, use it in the static displays too of the, of the motionless planes on the ground. Think of uh, things in odd numbers too. Our brain psychologically likes groups of three, but odd number groups uh, in general. Look for leading lines. Now that can be, uh, you know, maybe the ramp on the uh, 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 on the ground where the planes are taxiing. Uh, that could be a wing, as you saw used in some of the other example photos earlier. Just something to draw the viewer's eye into the scene. Um, and, uh, and allow the viewer to linger a little bit longer. So those are some things to think about. They don't always work in air show photography, but uh, it never hurts to keep on the back of the mind. Now, again, I'm with Tamron. You may have similar lenses in your camera bag from other manufacturers. They're gonna do a great job for you. Obviously, we'd love you to have every lens in your bag be a Tamron, uh, but that, you know, you've, you've already made an investment. Um, use what you got. And in Tamron designations, just to, for clarification, I'll give these to you really quickly. The DI lenses are our full frame lenses. They'll fit full frame cameras, they'll fit crop sensor cameras, and pretty much with adapters, and you can get all kinds of adapters uh, to even put different brands of lenses on different bodies now. Pretty much anything that you can adapt the lens to, uh, you're, gonna get a, you're gonna get a shot with it. Uh, so it'll cover the full frame and full frame would be equivalent to like the old 35 millimeter frame, approximately 24 by 36 millimeters. And a lot of pro cameras and some amateur and prosumer cameras have full frames. The most popular consumer level cameras are what we call uh, APS-C crop sensors. The sensor is about a third smaller uh, than the full 35 millimeter frame. So we have a line of lenses that are specifically optimized for that. And again, you may be able to adapt them uh, to other bodies as well. I use my, uh, my 18 to 400 routinely on my full frame mirrorless camera, which I don't, well, I do have handy. 
And because of the adapter that stands the lens off of the camera a little bit, the 18 to 400 actually works exceptionally well on, uh, on full frame mirrorless cameras. Doesn't happen with full frame DSLRs nearly so much, but a lot of DSLRs have a sensor that, that when you put a, a, a crop sensor lens on, if it fits, uh, the camera will, will know how to crop and, and uh, show you uh, marks in the viewfinder too. So there's a full line of, of crop sensor lenses. And then our, our catch-all for mirrorless mount lenses right now, and this is for Sony and Micro Four Thirds and uh, Canon M mount, and we have you know some lenses and all those mounts right now. But those that's kind of our catch-all term for mirrorless mount lenses right now. So if you don't have a mirrorless body, uh, don't worry about DI3 lenses at the moment. Also maximizing technology. Uh, Tamron uh, didn't invent stabilization, but I feel our engineers perfected it. Um, we call our stabilization vibration compensation. Uh, now, as I mentioned earlier, mirrorless bodies tend to have in-body stabilization. So on a lot of our newest mirrorless lenses, we actually don't include stabilization built into the lens because you can take advantage of it in the body. But for the lenses that do have it, it's going to allow you to shoot at lower shutter speeds uh, than you could handheld uh, with a non-stabilized lens. So it's, it can be a big benefit for you. And, uh, and again, it's, uh, it's something like you saw with that uh, 150 to 600 where I got a short picture at a 40th of a second handheld because of the stabilization technology. I couldn't have done that handheld with an unstabilized lens to save my life. Uh, some other suggestions when we get out in the field, set your camera to continuous autofocus or AI servo. It depends upon what your uh, your brand name as to what that's called. And uh, I'm a per, I prefer to use a spot focus or a center group. Uh, so there's, you know, there's a small group of focus points that you can narrow down to. Uh, some of my colleagues really are big fans of the uh, tracking on all points, or I think Nikon calls it the 3D autofocus. Uh, but again, go out and experiment before the air show uh, with, you know, maybe at a local uh, uh, commuter airport or something like that, or just even cars driving past on the highway and see what focus mode works best with your camera and lens combination. Uh, and it can vary, but I'm a big believer in spot focus or that center group. And most modern cameras have a little uh, thumb wheel <coughs> there or there or somewhere on the back of the camera that you can use under your thumb to move those focus points around so they're not stuck in the middle of, of the frame. And uh, virtually all cameras have that. Again, check your owner's manual to find out how to make that control. Of course, you wanna set your camera to high speed continuous uh, shooting uh, so that you can get the maximum uh, number of frames. It's, it's not necessarily spraying and praying, but sometimes you just have to uh, there's, you know, there's nothing like that. The ability of a camera to shoot really fast. Uh, you're going to come back with more bad shots, but you're also going to come back with more good shots. Uh, most modern cameras, again, will, will be a minimum of three and four frames a second. Uh, five or six frames a second has, uh, in, in my uh, observation, kind of become the norm. And uh, again, high ISO if you need it. Uh, also try auto ISO in your manual exposure. If I want to carry a specific shutter speed, I want to know that I'm shooting a prop plane and I'm not going to vary from a 250th of a second. And I want to make sure that I have a, a good amount of depth of field. Maybe I want to shoot at F11 or F16. I'll set those or whatever combination I want. And then I'll tell my camera to use auto ISO. Now this is something that's uh, mostly in newer cameras, probably if your camera is over about six years old, it may not offer auto ISO, check your manual to, to find out. But it can be a great tool if you're shooting in manual exposure, just uh, it, it, uh, uh, it allows the camera to still be automatic and that it will move the ISO up and down, but you're assured of dialing in that, uh, that shutter speed aperture combination that's gonna be what you're envisioning to get the shots that you want. So here's some more homework. Again, 
work the subject, zoom in and zoom out, move around, get higher, you know, for the static shots on the ramp, especially get higher and get lower. I'll carry knee pads with me. I'll carry uh, like a gardener's kneeling pad if I, if I have the space or just like uh, knee pads that you can get at the hardware store for construction work work great or you know volleyball knee pads that sort of thing anything to make it easier to kneel down and be able to stand back up and just change your field of view all all oftentimes not so much at air shows but i'll carry a step ladder along with me to just get my perspective or my point of view two three four feet higher uh than i could normally standing and just think about don't always make your shots from your normal standing height most of us are you know, between four and six and a half feet tall, uh, vary that and, and don't just shoot at your normal standing height. And play around, uh, provide environment, maybe shoot a little bit wider than you think you want. Uh, and also, uh, again, be selective with your uh, depth of field, shoot large apertures, play with small apertures, and, you know, see what you want to have in the shot. Uh, so, you know, what you want to exclude or include within the, uh, within the sharp focus area. So when we get out on the ramp, you saw this photo earlier in color. And again, I don't do a lot of post-processing, but especially with vintage aircraft, if you have the opportunity, not all air shows offer this, or you may not have the opportunity to do it. But uh, a couple of years ago at an air show in Sioux Falls, the, uh, the local commemorative Air Force group uh, did a fundraiser and they, they, they hold this air show every three years. Uh, and uh, they do a fundraiser where they bring in uh, people in period costumes and they also bring in uh, some of the vintage aircraft and it's an evening and nighttime thing. So you have a, an opportunity to shoot with smaller crowds and, uh, and get a lot more access. So if, if this is a possibility, this cost me a $20 donation and it was, it was well worth it. I had an evening of just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say it, total photo geekery. And I had a great time and uh, brought home a lot of photos like this. I shot this initially in color, but I knew immediately, I think uh, because uh, again, I shot so long with black and white film, I think in shades of gray. And I thought this has to be uh, converted to, to monochrome and it has to have a little sepia tone thrown in on it. And it just makes the photo and especially with vintage uh, aircraft and especially like, you know, at, at late in the evening, early in the morning, when you, if you, if you can get those kinds of opportunities to visit the airfield uh, again, before or after the crowds, uh, spend the extra few bucks and take advantage of it if you can, because you're going to get great opportunities. So again, that's a, that's a little thing for post-processing too. Now, again, another homework assignment, uh, as I mentioned earlier, work the subject, move around, zoom in and zoom out, and just keep, uh, just keep playing. Uh, this uh, is at the Reno Air Race a couple of years ago. And again, this is the plane that I flew in uh, to get that uh, to get that shot of the uh, of the uh, the air to air photograph, so uh, work the subject and you're you're going to be in tight spaces and you're going to be with crowds and that's why it's best to just keep working and get in closer and closer. Um, that little uh, specular highlight there with the sun kind of peeking around an engine cowling there. Uh, stop your lens down to a small aperture, at least f11. And if you can go to 16 or 22, you'll get that nice starburst. Now with Tamron lenses, because our lenses stop down to a very circular aperture shape, you're going to get a lot of star rays. Uh, depending upon the brand of lens you're using, you might only get starbursts of five or six points uh, where, where the lens just simply doesn't stop down to a circular aperture. Uh, so another Tamron advantage, but you're going to get good results no matter what you do. And then just keep working, get closer. This is the port that I was actually photographing from. Uh, they had a prop, uh, a prop gun for, the, uh, for when the plane was on the ground that they removed for the photographers too. So uh, we were able to shoot out that portal. Also, <clears throat> especially on the ground, uh, you, may, you don't have this luxury of planes in flight necessarily, but look for the good light. Uh, the left hand shot, uh, bright, broad sunlight, clear, cloudless day. Um, you, you get a lot of contrast. You get a lot of highlights and shadows that the camera's light meter and, uh, and sensor just can't deal with as well. Uh, if you can, move around to the shaded side. 
and there you're going to get the, uh, a lower dynamic range. So you're going to be able to see more highlights, more midtones, and more shadows. So just those little things like that. Look for the good light, and if you can, uh, move from the bright side to the shaded side, and you're going to get more good detail. Uh, at air shows especially, uh, look for the cool nose art on airplanes. Uh, pilots uh, have uh, good and sometimes strange senses of humor, and you can find all kinds of neat things, and you know, maybe you get your company's name on an airplane too. So uh, that can be fun. And look for those moments. Uh, this was at the end of the day at that Sioux Falls Air Show. This was actually, I think, six or seven years ago, and I still keep this in my, in my presentation. Uh, just because everything kind of fell into place here. The blue sky matched the, the paint color on the fuselage. I had that nice gray uh, mid-tone on the wing, the crew chief and propellers uh, at just the right positions there. And again, you have no control over that, but everything just kind of fell into place here and just makes, uh, you, you hear about tension and resolution. Uh, it's not a tense shot, it's a very resolved shot. So. Uh, those are things to look for. And there were, again, it was at the end of the day, there were thousands of people streaming past uh, just behind me, just out of the shot. Uh, but if you can be selective and, uh, and creative, you're going to get those neat shots. And again, if you have those early and late access times, uh, you're going to be able to really uh, exploit what the light can do for you. So uh, if you can pay for early and late access, uh, if it's feasible, and not every air show is, is going to have the luxury of, of offering you that. And again, the one in Sioux Falls is actually on an Air Force base, which is shared with the commercial airport. So uh, security is incredibly tight. Uh, I couldn't have made this shot at Sioux Falls like I, I did with the B uh, uh, with the B-16, but at another airfield with uh, where it was a, a non-military airbase, we had uh, the ability and the luxury to, to pay for access. So once the planes get in flight, uh, then you have more opportunities. This is a unique uh, opportunity I had uh, a couple of months ago, uh, the day the Air Force Academy had its graduation. The uh, Thunderbirds every year come into the Academy and do a flyby. Uh, for the uh, for the cadets that have just been uh, newly minted second lieutenants, uh, but this year because of the unique situation with COVID, uh, they did a salute flight and they flew all around the state of Colorado. Uh, so I was literally out my front door practically to get this shot, uh, and all year long the Blue Angels and local National Guard uh, squadrons and the the Thunderbirds are doing flybys. Around, uh, around states uh, all over the country. So uh, watch the news for those. And this is kind of unique because we have the this, this six uh, aircraft that do all of the aerobatics and they fly a couple of support planes with them. I got number seven, I was never able to get number eight in the frame uh, because uh, they, were, they were flying, uh, seven and eight were flying too loose. Uh, but you know, it was a unique opportunity. So look not only for air shows, but those sorts of flybys. A couple of weeks after that, the Colorado Air National Guard did, uh, again, a, sli a flyby around the state to salute the, the first responders and, uh, and uh, medical technicians and, and police and fire and the people that are on the front lines of the COVID crisis. And uh, the, the Thunderbirds, I was able to gauge within a half a mile of what their flight plan was. Uh, the Air National Guard in my state uh, didn't publish quite as detailed a flight plan, so I had to guess, and I was off by about three miles, but I was able to still get a very unique shot. And here's one of those ones where you simply go with what you have, and I made the silhouette of the planes flying along the, the front range uh, of the Rockies. That's the Never, the Never Summer range. Uh, on the kind of the northern end of the Rocky Mountain National Park. And I was, uh, I was in Loveland, Colorado. They were somewhere just over the foothills, uh, several miles west of Loveland. And again, I suspected I was about three miles away. So even if you can't get real close to the action, you know, take your longest lens crop if you have to. And, you, and I, I wasn't thrilled with this shot, but I put it up on social media that afternoon. And it was one of the shots uh, that I've published all year, or posted all year, that's gotten the most likes. So even if you're not sure, take the shots and, uh, and uh, have some fun with them. 
when you're at the shows, look for peak action. Um, and I generally find that most of the, if you're, if you're on the flight line at an air show, uh, probably you can shoot somewhere between around 100 and 400 millimeters. You don't always have to have five or 600 millimeters in a long telephoto. Uh, and, you, and, and a wide angle is great if you get a, a lower flyby. Uh, but look for that peak action. You know, I had the, the wing walker here as the plane was uh, was going through a roll. And here on the uh, uh, on the, the lower left side is uh, the pl plane was going up, did a hammerhead stall, and, and it's fun to watch, but they get lost in their smoke trail. So when the pilot snaps the the uh, the stick and the and kicks the ailerons around uh, and comes back out of that, that's the shot that I look for. And you you get that again. You get that leading line of the trailing smoke that starts at the bottom of the frame and brings the viewer's eye literally right into that spot where the aircraft is. Look for the heritage flights. Uh, most air shows will bring in vintage airplanes that will fly with modern airplanes. Uh, and here's just an example of that. Uh, this was actually uh, a group of four different planes, but I focused on the P-51 and the A-10 because they're kind of two different uh, uh, applications of plane from vastly different eras. And then I got lucky at the bottom right-hand corner again uh, at the Reno Air Race a few years ago, one of the race planes was taxiing out to do a few late afternoon flybys. And we had a flyby from, a, uh, uh, from the Arkansas Air National Guard and they dipped in and had zoomed by it uh, at uh, several hundred miles an hour. So I had my shutter speed set at a 250th of a second for that prop blur. And I, I had some motion blur obviously at the jet flying by, but it, uh, it creates an interesting shot in those sorts of situations. And again, as you're shooting, uh, follow planes as they're flying away from you, uh, catch them as they're coming back toward you, uh, and use those smoke trails again to act as leading lines to, uh, to bring the viewer's eye into the shot. Uh, a little bit about composition, and I'll come back around to this in a moment, but give the planes a little bit of space to fly into if you can. It, it creates a less tense composition also. So solving other problems, my colleague Armando was uh, at the, uh, the air races, uh, the Red Bull air races down in San Diego uh, be before Red Bull discontinued doing this, which is a shame because it was a great event to photograph and they were all over the country. But um, here he, uh, he went for the, for the first round and he wanted to travel light. So he just took his 70 to 200. And this is partially based on my suggestion telling him that, you know, most air races or air shows, you're going to shoot around 100 to 400. So he thought, I've got a good position, maybe the 70 to 200 is going to do it for me. And he discovered that wasn't quite enough, but he had in his bag that day also uh, the matched 1.4 times teleconverter, which increases magnification by by 1.4 times. So that gave him a little better look for the, for the rest of, uh, of that series of shots. And then the next day he decided he was going to go uh, fully prepared and brought back the 150 to 600 with that match 1.4 teleconverter. And again, he really filled up the frame and got the shots he was looking for. But again, with modern cameras, you know, shoot, uh, shoot as, as best you can. And you're, you're going to be able to crop 50% if you have to, maybe more uh, to get the shot that you want. Now, again, going back to that composition thought, uh, I shot this with the 100 to 400 uh, of just the single aircraft with that matched 1.4 teleconverter again, but I gave it a lot of space, a lot of negative space, uh, room to fly into. Uh, so that's something to consider in your shots. They don't always have to be tightly grouped, although certainly the tight groups look good. And also, uh, if you don't know about custom white balance, read a little bit about that, Google it. Uh, the, the store carries custom white balance tools and in an emergency, you can even do a custom white balance off of a sheet of white paper if you have to. I like the, uh, I like the Expo disc from Expo Imaging, but there are a number of good color balance tools because uh, from a sunny day to a cloudy day, the color is going to be completely different and it's just the way your camera sees things. So I'm a big fan of custom white balance and I will generally 
uh, do that custom white balance uh, at the beginning of a sequence of shots, just to make sure that from image to image to image, I'm not having to do as much in post. Because even uh, if you shoot raw files, you know, it, the, the fun of photography is not manipulating the images or tweaking things that you could have done right in the field. It's the actual shooting. So the more you do right in the field, uh, the more fun you're gonna have. Now this, I, I included uh, this, this last uh, three shots, and this one in particular, I shot at 600 millimeter as the, as the, the Thunderbirds were flying away from me, and you get that fantastic compression from telephotos. And anything from 200 millimeters and beyond, the telephoto is going to start to compress distance, and it's going to make those planes uh, look much closer together. This isn't the way it looked to, the, to your eye visually, but it's a really great technique to use for your air show photos. And again, uh, zooming in tight, uh, I, I will shoot a little bit loose, but for this, I just, I wanted that stacked look, that compression. The planes aren't nearly as close as they appear to be obvious. They're, they're flying a safe distance apart. Um, the advantage if you can go to an air show for multiple days is knowing when different things are going to happen. I, I missed this shot again the first day, but I was able to just to just nail it on uh, on day two of the air show. Uh, they Again, they perform the same routine day after day so that they don't crash and don't run into each other. Uh, and that's a, a, a good thing to, to think about too. Again, multiple days, you're gonna see the same air show uh, with minor variations, but you're gonna, you're gonna get uh, more opportunities to get the shots that, you know, day one, you missed it, maybe day two, you kill it and you nail it. Um, this is another one of those ones where I decided to follow just a single aircraft. They had just gone up and split out uh, from the top. Uh, you can see where they shut off the smoke and then they, they come into nearly a, 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 flat, uh, a flat dive and then pull out of it. And uh, again, it makes for a, a, a very cool composition. Uh, just another reminder about custom white balance. Uh, I did not white balance. This is uh, shots a few minutes apart. And uh, again, if you're a JPEG shooter, especially custom white balance is gonna keep your color uh, spot on rather than being a little, you know, a little off one way or the other. And in JPEG, uh, you don't have as much opportunity as you would in RAW to go back and fix those things. Now in my workflow, I shoot JPEG and RAW, so I have the maximum uh, capability for sharing. Uh, I'll, go in a, I'll go to an event, I'll throw a few photos on my phone, I'll post them to social media, and I'll get an email from the office the next day. Jeff, love those photos. Why don't you send us a half a dozen so we can use them for our social media today? And, uh, you know, then I'm stuck. If I have JPEGs, I can just pick out six or whatever, throw them in a folder and email them off uh, to the office if I have to. Uh, take raw files and convert them to JPEGs and do whatever else I need to do to uh, uh, to re reduce the file size too for for quick emailing. Uh, then I have a lot more work ahead of me. So I have my raw files that I that I always shoot, and I also always shoot the JPEGs. That way I've got the quick finished images from the JPEGs, uh, but that are much smaller file size because JPEG at the best quality is generally only recording about. Uh, a fourth of the data that the sensor is capable of recording. Raw file, of course, records all of the data and gives you more uh, ability if you over or underexposed, if the color balance was off, uh, easier to fix. Bring air protection if you go to an air show. Uh, even if it's just the simple little uh, foam things that you pop in your ear that you can buy at the drugstore for a couple of bucks, they're gonna save your hearing. I have a constant ringing in my ear. Now, part of that's from shooting air shows for uh, 40 years, part of that's for uh, shooting rock shows for 50 years, uh, part of that's from, you know, plinking around with guns. And, and when I, you know, when we were kids, uh, we didn't think about wearing ear protection and, uh, you know, I'm paying for it now. So again, ear protection is, uh, is gonna be vital. And uh, last but not least, uh, this was the ultimate in planning and luck. Uh, <clears throat> this was at that Fort Worth Air Show that I mentioned uh, was last October. Now for the entire week leading up to this air show, I was in on the coast in Oregon uh, teaching at a, uh, and, and working at a, uh, 
uh, a landscape and nature and outdoor photography seminar. And I'm seeing the moon coming up every night and more importantly, going down every morning and it's later and later. The moon rises and sets about 40 minutes later every day. And I'm thinking on uh, Monday and Tuesday, wow, by the time it gets to Saturday and Sunday when I'm at the air show, uh, I'm gonna have the moon in a very unique position. So uh, I got lucky and uh, you know, I had, I had even scoped out which direction the, uh, the air show was gonna be set up and it was on a north-south uh, runway. So I knew that the moon was gonna be in a place where the planes would be flying uh, for, uh, for their demonstration runs. And the F-16 demo team, uh, the first day did these great runs, but the moon was a little too high and the planes didn't quite fly where I wanted to. And I thought the moon's gonna be a little bit lower tomorrow or I should say the moon was a little bit low and the planes, the planes weren't flying that low. The next day, the moon was a little higher in the sky because it, again, it sets later. And what, what happened was it was right where I needed it to be. And again, I, I had the camera on the continuous focus. I acquired focus on the plane that I thought was gonna break and fly toward the moon. And again, I used that small group uh, of uh, focus points to, because again, when you're when you're racked all the way out and you're you're trying to get the shot now i actually shot this with the 18 to 400 it wasn't this big beast of the uh, of the 150 to 600 but still you're racked all the way out and it's it's still going to be a leap of faith i had to, i had the camera in continuous click 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 firing away the shot before this the moon wasn't in the frame and the shot after this the the moon was just barely in the frame so a little a little planning uh, and some luck and some execution all came together for the shot. Now also, uh, you'll notice this looks a little noisy. This is about a 75% crop and I was shooting at ISO 800 on the D500 Nikon at a thousandth of a second at F8. And uh, when you crop 75%, you're gonna see some noise. So uh, it's, it's probably not gonna ever make an enlargement uh, much bigger than the uh, than the uh, the eight by ten here over my shoulder, uh, but it's it's one of those ones that's definitely going to make it to the wall. So plan, prepare, uh, and and add some luck. And uh, I talked a little bit long here. We're we're uh, over an hour, but uh, that's the end. Again, thanks so much to our friends at uh, at Action Camera. We're going to open up the floor for questions. Again, I'm Cameron Tech.